Hello and welcome to a special webinar event on insights into IT economics and driving infrastructure efficiency featuring Red Hat and IDC and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in our webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of each of our two presentations here, where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you ask. The Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, and slide advancement issues. But if that doesn't work, just let us know there in the Q&A and we will provide further technical assistance. Second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. I'd especially like to call your attention to a link for getting started with Red Hat. You'll also find a link to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, where you can get access to Actual Tech Media's great printed resources on technology topics, as well as a link to the ATM Event Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events. So I encourage you to access those resources now and feel free to share them with your friends and your colleagues. Now third, at the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. Official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. Finally, one of the best benefits of this event is the opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenters and to help encourage your questions. We have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card. This one for $50 for the best question. So at the end of the event, we'll look through all the questions that came in, pick out the very best one and contact that prize winner. So with all that, let's get to today's fantastic content. We've got two great presentations today. For the first one, we'll be covering maximizing profits with an efficient efficient IT infrastructure. And presenting for this session are Siddharth Nagar, Director of Product Management for Enterprise Linux at Red Hat, and Randy Hildbrandt, Senior Manager of Go-To Marketing uh, Market uh, Portfolio Product Marketing at Red Hat. So Randy, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Hello, welcome to Maximize Profits with an Efficient IT Infrastructure using the Red Hat Multiplier. I'm Randy Hildebrandt, Red Hat Portfolio Product Marketing Manager, and with me today is Siddharth Nagar, Product Manager for the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Many are challenged to safely and effectively extend their environment to the infrastructure edge or deploy applications to meet their increasing business needs, perhaps using container technology, container technology, or to improve performance and increase security, but they may wonder, how can they do this with the mandate to keep costs down? Siddharth and I would like to share with you three stories about how real customers addressed these challenges. They did so with the help of Red Hat as a trusted partner who helped to share best practices built by other customers who had to deal with similar challenges like this. Siddharth, would you expand on some of these challenges further, please? Happy to do so, Randy, and hello, everyone. CIOs today face an even greater challenge to scale their IT infrastructure to meet business needs in a cost-effective way. The pace of business continues to speed up, but budgets remain stagnant. Does this resonate with you, and especially those of you in IT operations? Today, we'd like to share with you three real world scenarios where customers of Red Hat have responded to such challenges. They have leveraged a multiplier that came from using several Red Hat solutions together. The multiplier has helped to answer critical questions like, how do I minimize service disruption to maximize revenue? How do I configure at scale? And how do I onboard new system administrators with the least amount of overhead. Let's take a look at how our first customer minimized service disruption to maximize revenue. 
In an increasingly services-based world, organizations expect the underlying IT infrastructure to guarantee high levels of uptime. Any downtime directly translates to a loss of revenue. The problem is compounded by the need to support multi-generational applications that require a mix of legacy and modern workloads. As the application stack ages, it becomes costly to maintain and hard to preserve the same levels of performance. This was precisely the kind of problem faced by the Australian Securities Exchange, or ASX. ASX's legacy systems were starting to become a liability and they sought the need for application modernization. Randy, would you please share more details on how Red Hat was able to aid ASX in this transformation? Sure, Siddharth. ASX analyzed and tested several platforms for stability, performance, flexibility, cost effectiveness, and availability of enterprise level support. It chose the combination of best of breed JBoss Enterprise application platform middleware and enterprise class operating system like uh, RHEL, Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux, that are integrated and available from Red Hat to deliver applications faster anywhere. ASX worked with Red Hat to build, test, launch, and deploy many critical business to business and public facing applications. With its new platform, ASX gained greater stability and faster, more effective recovery for its web applications, including achieving 60 times faster application restart speeds. In addition, ASX saved time and reduced support costs with Red Hat's subscription-based support model, freeing resources to develop innovative services. ASX also received expert hands-on training that improved staff knowledge. So let's look at another customer example. You know, in the next few years, Swiss Federal Railways, known as SBB, ranked among the world's best railway operators, plans to invest close to 1 billion US dollars annually in new and modernized trains to create smart, safe, and highly effective rail network. For example, new trains will include intelligent features such as the dynamic LED information displays, digital seating booking systems, CCTV safety monitoring, and Wi-Fi access. However, managing the devices supporting these features was difficult to the, due to the high volume and the lack of central control. After connecting all of its trains to the corporate network through the 4G LTE mobile routers, SBB sought to establish an IT infrastructure that could take advantage of this connection to centrally manage all of the intelligent devices across its rail network. In addition, a standardized IoT environment would simplify the development and launch of new services. Siddharth, would you please share how SBB configured, deployed, and patched at scale their ever-moving data centers? Yes, of course, Randy. SBB standardized on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Red Hat Ansible Automation, and Red Hat Satellite as the backbone of its next generation platform. This platform satisfied the requirement to support intelligent service devices across more than 100,000 onboard systems. The core of SBB's updated device environment is Red Hat Enterprise Linux, an enterprise operating system that provides a stable, reliable foundation for scaling existing applications and adopting emerging technology. Running in this environment, Red Hat Ansible Automation helps SBB automate complex deployments and centrally control its IT infrastructure through a visual dashboard with features such as role-based access, scheduling, integrated notifications, and graphical inventory management. The rail operator used Ansible's RESTful Application Perform Programming Interface, or API, 
and command line interface, CLI, to embed it into existing tools and processes. This solution has allowed the Swiss Railways to scale and manage their sprawling infrastructure in a cost-effective manner. It has also allowed them to allocate more resources to driving innovation in the service of their customers. Next, let's take a look at one final success story where the customer balanced the skills gap with the need to meet the demanding needs of the business. Headquartered in Tokyo, SoftBank is one of Japan's largest telecommunications service providers. The company has made concerted efforts to minimize manual processes to reduce costs by half through the use of automation and easy onboarding of operations personnel. In 2016, they adopted the slogan, smart and fun, to encourage employees to use the time saved through the use of technologies for innovative and creative activities to further the business. SoftBank is acutely aware of the cost of hiring, training, and retaining associates. This issue is getting worse as the demand for Linux operation skills grows. SoftBank sought a partner who can help to make Linux technology accessible to a wider range of associates who are often less skilled in Linux administration. Investing in an operating system that has all the hooks built in for automation was a key decision. Randy, would you please share more details on SoftBank's pain points and how they were able to effectively address them working with Red Hat Solutions? Sure, Siddharth. So the SSL certificates are important for the security of a server connection. However, updating each system required different operators and procedures. For the updates, SoftBank needed to prepare a manual for each operation with each update taking 30 minutes to two hours to perform and dependent on individual skills. Additionally, changes to industry rules now required more frequent updates to SSL certificates, requiring SoftBank administrators to make updates about 800 times per year. That's a lot. To reduce work hours, SoftBank deployed Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform now reports a reduction in time required for updating from as much as two hours down to as little as 20 seconds. SoftBank has also been able to reduce work hours by updating by 99%. Additionally, by using Ansible playbooks to share automation across the company, updates can now be performed more accurately and quickly. SoftBank reports that burdens on employees who conducted the updates at night were also reduced and spare time has been used to learn new skills and improve operations. Red Hat Consulting played an important role in integrating this solution. Siddharth, would you share how Red Hat can help customers scale their IT infrastructure? We know that cloud can not solve every challenge and organically improving your existing infrastructure is also not the right answer. Organizations must scale their IT needs to match the business priority. Our analysis has led us to conclude that organizations must focus on three pillars to achieve digital transformation to enable their business. First, extend your architecture to run both traditional and new cloud native workloads anywhere whether that's from the data center or to the edge. Second, modernize application development to support cloud native applications that can be highly integrated and continuously deployed. And lastly, support management at scale by enabling automation across applications, teams, and processes. Two additional items that overlay across each of these multipliers are training and services that help teams improve their processes in order to get the most out of an open hybrid cloud approach, and partner ecosystem that gives customers technologies that are tested, supported, and certified with most major cloud hardware and software providers. 
We refer to this in aggregate as Red Hat's Open Hybrid Cloud Strategy. It's open because it's based on enterprise open source software for access to stable community innovation, open standards for broad compatibility, and open APIs for flexible integrations. This strategy helps you to architect, develop, and operate a hybrid mix of applications and delivers a truly flexible experience with the speed, stability, and scale required for digital business transformation. Now, Randy, what are some of the next steps folks can take to learn more? Thank you, Siddharth. So, you know, as we move to our Q&A time, please feel free to note your questions in our Q&A area. You know, we only touched on a small portion of this multiplier in, our short, in a short time here. So where can you find out more about Red Hat Solutions? Well, you can go to <clears throat> like the link there, red.ht slash built hyphen on hyphen Linux, or you can uh, look further at the customer case studies we've shared using the links provided here. There is so much more about these customer stories for you to explore, showing you how these solutions help them overcome their challenges. Just download the PDF presentation for the links, or we'll be glad to send you the PDF presentation. Please note that we've done other webinars in our customer story series on the Red Hat Multiplier, which covers scale IT infrastructure at the pace of your business, drive business agility to meet infrastructure needs, open for business with the security IT infrastructure, and scale your infrastructure to support your business. Now, let's go into our Q&A time. Please add your questions so that we may answer them at this time. Great. So let's now take our <clears throat> first question that we have. One is, you know, we're a small to medium business. What options do we have to engage with Red Hat? Siddharth, you want to take that one? Happy to. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact our direct sales team for assistance. Our specialists can discuss options to fit your needs and budget. And in all probability, Red Hat is already part of your channel or VAR vendor. Uh, we offer flexible deployment options and the choice to use only the specific products you need for your solution. We also offer low cost and no cost options for RHEL based on use case. For example, if you want to use uh, RHEL for development and non-production use, we have offerings catered specifically to that at no cost to you. So for more comprehensive information, please don't hesitate to check out the, the link that we've mentioned up top there and to call us directly uh, via our regular support contact channels that are on the website. Great. Um, another question is that, you know, they noticed that services were a big part of some of these customers' implementations. So how exactly does Red Hat and its partners help to ensure successful implementations? That's a great question. Well, you know, Red Hat services and our partners really can help in two ways. Uh, first, Red Hat training provides the enablement to you know, your teams with curriculums and certifications that span the Red Hat, Red Hat uh, product portfolio, you know, covering the RHEL, Red Hat um, OpenShift, Red Hat Ansible for the organizations um, that are interested in automation and others. And the second way is with uh, the Red Hat Consulting, assisting in your adoption processes with their expertise in these products, along with partners helping um, as well to leverage these Red Hat products to meet those business needs, really to gauge with Red Hat services and the consultant or training. Just talk to your account executive, your partner and the territory or the territory services manager and just or go to redhat.com uh, uh, services and they'll be able to help you. Now, here's another question. Uh, how can you deploy Red Hat solutions without deep expertise? So, Darth, you want to try that one? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you, your relationship with Red Hat is 
not just about the bits. Uh, it's open source, so you know anyone can get access to the bits or the source and build on their own. Uh, customers with at least one active subscription can get access to our award-winning customer portal where you can find solutions to common issues. Uh, the customer portal also has in-depth content to help you understand best practices and learn from our customers who, who have had uh, to deal with similar problems. And more recently, we introduced Red Hat Insights, which is a service that helps to assess risk and recommend mitigations to your specific environment. Uh, RHEL also includes things like Web Console, which is a browser-based management dashboard that's specifically designed for novice Linux users. And finally, we, we, we have user-friendly image building services that allow you to quickly create your corporate standard build uh, because it's not just about the OS software, it's additional uh, applications that you need to include. Um, so building and deploying it on premises or in a public cloud environment uh, is just some of the standard tooling that's available to you as part of your subscription. That's great. So another one is how does the Red Hat multiplier work? You know, we referred, I know they got that because we referred to the Red Hat multiplier, but what exactly is that? So there's probably three things that come to mind when I think about the Red Hat multiplier. Most want a holistic view of their infrastructure. You, know, you want to manage your stack and not individual pieces of your stack. Well, Red Hat takes great care here to align the life cycles, the backward compatibility upgrades. So to the stack supports your infrastructure efficiently. Red Hat can really greatly reduce the cost of operations by providing a fully integrated set of products here to support those needs. Second, that comes to mind is uh, about another aspect that we <clears throat> know to be important is that security. Um, Red Hat has the built-in security features that flow upward uh, through the Red Hat solutions used by RHEL to inherit those security features. That's what is meant by that Red Hat multiplier and the value that allows uh, the data and the features to be leveraged by the Red Hat products used together. And then I think a third consideration is our partner ecosystem that gives customers the technologies uh, that are tested, supported, and certified uh, with most major cloud hardware and the software providers. Okay, um, I think this might be our last question, um, uh, Siddharth. So how can we evaluate RHEL and some of these other products we've mentioned that the customers have uh, addressed their challenges with? You want to uh, take that one, uh, Siddharth? Sure, sure, yeah, happy to do that. Um, we have uh, a lot of product trials that are uh, available on offer yeah. uh, that, that you can get access um, from the link that we mentioned above. Uh, and these product trials are included in uh, a Red Hat subscription. Uh, but Red Hat product trials are more than just access to the latest code. Uh, of course, that is something that's key. Uh, but they also provide access to all versions of the software, to patches, and other software updates. So it's not just about a, a one-time drop. Uh, but also included as part of this trial is access to things like the customer portal that has just such a rich wealth of information uh, for, for you to be able to search on and apply to your needs. Once your product trial subscription is active, we'll provide you with a, a download of the latest version of the success page, uh, which is to say that the page that opens after you click uh, through your start your trial link and it's also accessible from uh, the confirmation email you, you will receive uh, once you've registered. You can download the software from the download section or, or on the customer portal um, following the links that's in your instruction email or on the portal. Uh, some trials are uh, accessed in the cloud rather than, than directly downloadable from Red Hat pr uh, properties. Uh, but in those instances, will provide instructions on, on how uh, best to access your trial. 
So lots of options, uh, and we give you detailed instructions along the way. Great, great. Okay, um, so that's all our questions today. So this really closes out today's discussion on maximizing the profits with an efficient IT infrastructure using the Red Hat Multiplier. So we look forward to helping you in any way. Check out our Red Hat Multiplier webinars, these other webinars uh, about our customer stories that focus on addressing their many challenges, as we mentioned earlier. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for attending, and thanks, and have a great day. Okay, great stuff, Randy and Siddharth. And now we'll move into the day's second presentation. We've got Ashish Nadkarni from IDC, who's going to present some research on how big a market force Red Hat Enterprise Linux is becoming. It's really interesting stuff, and helping Ashish out during the presentation will be Gunnar Helixson from Red Hat, and then moderating your questions for Ashish and Gunnar will be Susan Ropar. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ashish. To be here, and thank you all for joining today's webinar. We have some um, exciting stuff to show you, stuff that usually doesn't get talked about in the context of um, Red Hat Linux. Um, and so the conversation we want to have about with you today is the economic impact of Red Hat Linux. Now, I must say that given that operating systems and the foundational role they play in, in a technology stack, regardless of where it gets deployed, you often don't think about how much of an impact they have on the economy, on your own economy, as well as the global economy. And so what we are here to tell you is that it can go into the trillions when, when you look at just the installed base of Red Hat Linux, wherever it is deployed, however it is deployed, and any kind of workloads that it supports today. And so the study was done um, in, in conjunction with Red Hat um, we've been doing it for a few years now, and the latest report just continues to give us insightful information on how customers are deploying Red Hat Linux and how that, that translates to the economic impact um, globally. So I want to start with us in a slightly unconventional way, and the reason I want to do that is because I think this conversation of the economic impact of Red Hat needs to start at the highest level. And so why does it need to start at the highest level? Let's start with the stats that we've gathered from our uh, CEO survey um, earlier this year. So wh what we have found is that 83% of chief executive officers at companies are, they, they believe that having the right technology leader um, to drive digital transformation is critical or very important in 2022. We are just turning a corner with the pandemic. We are looking at a new era, if, uh, if, if anything, on digital resiliency. People are making sure their technology stacks are current. They can operate in a way that can withstand global headwinds. And so with all of that in mind, I think people are looking at CIOs or companies are looking at CIOs um, as a strategic, uh, you know, the, as, as a person who drives strategic change and also looks at the company's uh, econometric models, uh, which, at, you know, of course, they start at the hardware level, but they work their way all the way into the workloads and operating systems, Red Hat Linux in particular, play a pretty important role um, in, in building that model out. So as you can see, the, 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 the chart here shows how um, CEOs are expecting CIOs to play a more uh, strategic initiative um, in or a strategic role in, in driving you know, global initiatives and modernizing, you know, making sure that a digital transformation can deliver better business agility and of course delivers new revenue streams quickly. These are all top of mind for um, a lot of CEOs. And um, this is where the conversation starts and the economic impact of Red Hat Linux, this is where the conversation starts. So I thought I would start here just to kind of show you, um, you know, how important this conversation is. Now, moving on to what kind of role can Red Hat Linux play in, in the CIO agenda? So now we are switching gears to looking at what are the initiatives that CIOs are chartered with 
given given the important role they play. Um, so clearly, the top of mind is um, ESG. You know, I, I think it's top of mind for all CIOs these days. Um, you know, looking at a distributed core to edge to cloud, a, a IT is is top of mind. Uh, if you are into multi cloud, then FinOps is top of mind. Um, modernization, uh, being uh, being able to uh, have digital sovereignty over your data, um, and and a lot of these initiatives are driven by the infrastructure. And the infrastructure, of course, as we know, even though it starts with hardware, if you're doing it on prem or if in the cloud, you're starting with instances. What has a direct impact on anything that goes on top of it, which is the workloads that are uh, driving these initiatives is the operating system layer. That's where Red Hat Linux comes in. And that's where we started looking at the impact. So think of it as a multiplier effect. So if you have um, a, a server for argument's sake, or if you have a virtual machine <clears throat> with an operating system instance, it runs many workloads. And those workloads now have a direct impact on the company's business and therefore on the GDP of the country and therefore on the global economy. So that's kind of how we built out this model. That's kind of how we went about kind of saying, you know, for every instance that gets deployed, there is a multiplier effect that translates to the economic impact. So the survey kind of gave us very good insights on what um, what kind of impact uh, we, we are seeing. And, and so, I'm going to just give you, there are six of them here. So the first three on this slide and the next three on the, on, on the, on the following slide. The first is that the use of Red Hat in support of business activities provided financial benefits to customers to the tune of, hold your breath, 1.7 trillion in 2021. And that was almost evenly divided between you know, revenues and lower costs. But nevertheless, that number is staggering, and and it just goes to show how influential decisions can be. Now, if you take that and look at some of the spending, you know, it's uh, fifteen times. Like I mentioned, the multiplier effect, and here's the multiplier effect. It's fifteen times the spending on Red Hat Linux and associated products and services of the Red Hat Linux ecosystem, and it's two times the total direct and indirect investments. It, it's staggering. These numbers just, you know, we were, um, we've been doing this, like I said, for a few years now, and they continue to wow us, just given how um, the footprint continues to evolve. Uh, more workloads, different types of workloads. Um, and, you know, the Red Hat ecosystem has a big role to play in this as well. It's It contributed over 100 billion in 2021 to the economy and, and will bring in 123 billion in net new revenue by the end of 2026. Um, and for every dollar of revenue that Red Hat makes in 2022, the ecosystem will make 22 times that, so $22. And, and that's the impact, that's the power. And so looking at some of the workloads and migration and, and pandemic activities, so workloads and active, um, applications and data sets because storage is important here. Uh, but workloads um, running on Red Hat Linux will touch 13 trillion of business revenues and expenses in 2022. So what that means, as I said earlier, is Red Hat Linux is the infrastructure software platform for these workloads. And so every time there is a new instance, it has a multiplier effect. The migration to the cloud is speeding up deployment of virtualized Red Hat in Linux instances. So the revenue impact or the business impact just doesn't stop on prem it continues into the into the cloud as well and regardless of which cloud you pick um, and the pandemic accelerated um, a lot of red hat linux related project um, you know as, um, as as many as it paused or delayed so you know there was a balance there and of the projects that were paused or delayed um, everything 80% of them are on schedule to be restarted so by this year end of this year we'll have caught up and non red hat linux um, uh, red hat linux uh, related projects fared a little worse um, primarily because i think you know people are looking for standardization um, they're looking for consistency so they feel that you know if if it is on a 
consistent global foundation, they can accelerate it. And so this, I think a lot of you all know, but we should kind of point out that Red Hat Linux is not just a, a corporate um, software stack, right? It, it touches on many different types of IT environments, IT workloads, if you want to call it, all the way from product development, um, customer management and support, inventory control, production control, you know, it's so, you know, if you're thinking about this in a vertical sense, it touches manufacturing, it touches retail, it touches, um, you know, healthcare, um, it touches supply chain, it touches engineering, it touches web-based services. And then of course, internet of things and edge is also uh, important uh, because these are all, you know, um, use cases or initiatives, if you will. And um, this is a, a fantastic way for you all to see how diverse the installed base of Red Hat Linux is. Now in the global economy, if you look at the impact of Red Hat Linux, so let's start with the footprint. So the, so the workloads I mentioned is 13 trillion, you know, so that's where it starts. Now, if you think, think about that in the context of the Linux footprint, that's 87 trillion. And then if you add the entire global IT footprint, that's 161 trillion. And then of course the business footprint is 206 trillion. So I just wanted to set the context here to see, you know, it's a small footprint that can have a very in, big influence on the global business footprint. And then it sort of is foundational. And what I'm trying to show here with the chart is that that 13 trillion can have a ripple effect on all of the outer shells, if you will, of the economy. And it's it's that's really the key message here. Now, we um, talked about it in the opening slide, you know, more than 10% of the global economy is powered by a single operating system. It's, it's not surprising, you know, given 30 years back when I was fiddling around with Linux, it was just very difficult to get it going and it required a lot of tweaking and tuning. What Red Hat has done to Linux is bring about that enterprise level stability, consistency, scale, you know, being able to run corporate business critical workloads, mission critical workloads, and people like that. It gives them all of the benefits of open source Linux, but it also gives them the key business benefits that they relied on previously on commercial Unix stacks. So when they move their workloads um, onto Linux, you know, they, they can get the best of both worlds. You know, the developer side is happy, the business side is happy as well. And of course, in the middle is IT, they're happy as well. And so what that means is people are adopting commercial Linux like Red Hat Linux today for that uh, consistency. And it goes, ties back to the CIO agenda that I talked about earlier. It's, you know, take 13 trillion, which is about 40,000 per person in the US. And then you look at how big it's gonna grow in, a four, in four years. Uh, it's going to be 17 trillion um 52000 per person in the us and it's all because of that consistency scale business benefits resiliency all of those things people will continue to want to have that uh, model across their multi cloud hybrid cloud deployments and they look for a foundational solution to get there now you know, people obviously benefit from it. You know, it's not just the internal benefits, but it also has an impact on the um, external, the, the way they go about doing business, you know. So we think that businesses can expect a direct impact of roughly 1.7 trillion in 2022, collectively, globally, uh, via increased revenues and lower costs by investing in Red Hat Linux. Now, this impact is expected to be more than 2.2 trillion using the math from before, um, it's a 33% increase in four years. Again, same reason, right? People want that consistency. They continue to invest and there's a multiplier effect and they get more out, of, more out of it. And of course, cost saving is important. You cannot have a conversation where you're just spending, right? It also has to, and it goes back to my uh, conversation earlier, the total impact, we measured it not just as a function of how much spend there is, but also how many dollars get saved. 
And and what we're saying here, what we found is that total cost supporting Red Hat, including hardware, you know, it's important. So virtualization density, the amount of workloads that you can have on a single instance, staffing, you know, the number of people that need to support um, compute uh, facilities, all of that total roughly 932, so slightly less than a trillion in, in 2022. Uh, and we, we feel that of that, there's 700 billion or so that is directly the consequence of um, opting for Red Hat Linux. Now, the benefits of Red Hat Linux. So this is where we start to get into why are people preferring a commercial um, Linux operating system like Red Hat Linux, and maybe commercial is the wrong word here, but basically the idea that you can get the best of both worlds from um, you know going for a, a Linux instance like Red Hat. Um, the first thing is that in 2022, the Red Hat customer ecosystem will earn 22.6, so 20, you know, roughly $23 for every dollar spent on Red Hat uh, as an operating environment. So think about all the different apps, think about all the different workloads. In 2022, um, Red Hat ecosystem is expected to surpass 100 billion in additional earned revenue. And of that, hardware contributes to 15%, additional software, roughly 40%, services, 30%, and the margins that people make, the money that people make, profits, 15%. And this value, we think, will grow to $140 billion by 2026. Now, Red Hat is very ubiquitous. You know, I, like I mentioned, 30 years back, Linux was getting there. But these days, you know, we think Red Hat Linux has... Um, you know, pretty much become a household name in IT and everybody knows about it. And, and you know, if you, if we have data that shows that Red Hat Linux is deployed on um, 9 million physical servers today. It's nearly four times um, as many virtual instances. So whether it's on-prem in public cloud and over half of the net new workloads deployed in the past two years were on Red Hat Linux. So just sort of goes to say how people are preferring um, Red Hat Linux for the benefits it brings you. Um, and the deployment preferences, again, people can do it on-prem or in the cloud. It functions the same, there is feature parity. And what it shows in the box on the right there, it shows you are the different types of workloads that are um, preferred. So content and collaboration, CRM workloads, IT infrastructure. So across the spectrum, you see that people want Red Hat Linux for all of the um, different uh, workloads. Now, the one, the last one there is of particular importance to me personally, because I also look at high performance computing. I look at engineering and technical workloads at IDC. And what we're seeing is that a lot of the HPC and AI and engineering workloads that used to be the privilege of select few are moving into mainstream and a lot of ITs, um, IT organizations are being chartered with having those workloads in their environment, whether it's, you know, HPC or AI infrastructure. So I would expect those to go up significantly. And of course, people want the same um, enterprise experience there and they prefer Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux. And in fact, a little small information for you. You know, there's a top 500 supercomputing. Um, Red Hat has a pretty significant footprint there, again, for the same reason. So all these research institutes also prefer uh, Red Hat Linux. So it's not just corporate IT. Research also has a pretty big uh, um, preference there. Now let's talk about the human impact of Red Hat Linux. So um, in IT, right? So we surveyed and made some models around it. It's uh, 990,000 non-IT professionals, and it's direct livelihood for 1.9 million IT professionals. And we think that in um, 2026, it'll be around 3.4 IT and non-IT professionals. So as you can see, the human uh, factor here is important as well. That many people directly de depend on Red Hat Linux in some way, shape, or form. So I wanted to sort of leave you with a couple of takeaways. And, and as uh, Susan mentioned, you are going to get the document which explains in great detail our model, uh, how we went about calculating the numbers. 
I want you to look at that 13 trillion. You know, like they say, a small in, uh, footprint can make a huge impact. This is exactly what it is trying to show. The Red Hat Linux footprint might be 13 trillion. Now we're talking trillions here, so bear with me on the numbers a little bit. But even with 13 trillion, um, the total footprint, the influence that it brings is at, at least what, 20 times higher, 206 trillion. And, and that's a pretty staggering amount. I think you should look at it in that way. A small footprint has such a huge impact, the multiplier effect on the global economy um, that it can sway the business footprint globally in, in one way or the other. And, and the testament in, uh, in the fact that people are investing more um, in, in IT infrastructure, they're preferring um, a Linux stack like Red Hat Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, means that they are looking for a lot of consistency, stability, elasticity, agility, all of that. And so the last slide, I just wanted to kind of close with a, a conversation around the role of Red Hat Enterprise Linux in a digital first world. Um, and here are five elements for you to take away. The first is the CEO and the C-suite engagement. We talked about it up front. Um, it is making sure that the digital dream team can scale. Um, the second one is the fact that people are looking for the value realization of technology here. Um, how do you deliver that tech value in days and weeks, not months and years? Um, the third one is digital organizational structure and readiness. And you could argue that the first two kind of directly influence this one. Moving from a project and a products-based organization um, to, to, a, um, to a services, right? It says products here, but you basically can get the idea. You're not doing it on a tactical level. You're doing it as a strategic long-term roadmap level. So you kind of have a pretty long-term view of how you plan to morph into a services organization, a product-based organization. Now, what enables that is the technology architecture. So the first one, which is what, what that says here, is going from this centralized archi IT architecture to an embedded business architecture to multi-cloud environments. And then, of course, last but not the least, and, and certainly it's center stage these days, is cybersecurity, cyber resilience, making sure that your assets are not just managed well, controlled well, but they are protected well as well. And with that, um, you know, I think there is a lot to say here. Um, I would um, ask you to read the report that will be showing up in your inbox. Um, and then we would love to have questions at the end of the webinar, um, you know, to, uh, to take, take care of any um, clarifications or any, um, you know, uh, concerns or questions you might have on, on the topic. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand this to uh, my colleague Gunnar. Uh, to talk about the Red Hat side of it. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, so, wow, I, uh, it's amazing to hear these numbers uh, uh, from my friend Ashish. When I think about when I first started using Linux, say 25 or 30 years ago, I was in my college dorm room and I was swapping out 40 or 50 three and a half inch floppies to try and install Linux on my laptop. and. At the time, if I was thinking about numbers in billions or trillions, uh, I was probably counting uh, the number of features that I wish I had or the number of hours that I wasted trying to get Linux working. Um, and we have come very far uh, from, from that experience. And so uh, thinking about this journey and how far we've come over the last 20 years as a Linux community and as Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, specifically, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at some of the research that we've done uh, some of this research uh, has already uh, has already been made public. This is our state of enterprise open source uh, survey that we uh, that we do regularly here at here at Red Hat. The other survey is an internal tool that we use uh, in order to uh, kind of take the temperature of the of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux market. And uh, I thought some of the results were were very interesting. And I thought uh, I thought putting the two together and then sharing it with you to kind of show how attitudes might have changed about Linux over time and uh, or about how they've how they've stayed the same. Um, so, uh, kind of a nice way to punctuate this uh, this 20th anniversary of, uh, of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So, uh, so let's jump in. So, the first result comes from the state of of enterprise open source report, and here we say we hear that IT leaders 
uh, say that 95% of them say that open source is important to their overall enterprise infrastructure strategy. This is, uh, this, this is unsurprising if you have been living in enterprise IT for the last, say, 10 years. It is shocking uh, if, like me, you were installing Linux uh, from floppies on a laptop 30 years ago, 25 years ago, um, because uh, the number was 95% was uh, the number of organizations that expressly forbid the use of Linux and open source 25 or 30 years ago. Um, and now the, uh, the, the bit is flipped, right? We're, we're in a completely different world now where 95% believe that open source is kind of essential to their, uh, essential to their success. Uh, so that's kind of gratifying. Um, now, if we get into the, the details of, of why they, uh, why they favor op not open source, but also specifically enterprise open source, that is open source supported by a vendor like, like Red Hat, um, uh, here is a, is a very familiar set of benefits. And these are, these benefits I think have been relatively consistent over the life, over the lifetime of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So people favor, uh, flexibility. Uh, they like having access to innovation. Um, I think the market has recognized that, uh, if you look at the major innovations we've made in IT over the last 20 years, uh, things like virtualization, things like containers, uh, things like cloud, all these innovations are kind of firmly rooted in, in Linux. And I think that accounts for, uh, for some of Linux uh, success over that time. Um, and so uh, also a very interesting result is, uh, again, the complete opposite of where we started, which was uh, before Linux and open source for a lot of organizations represented a security threat. Well, now 75% say it's an essential part of their security strategy. So um, we're going to go into more detail uh, on that in a, in a bit. Um, so the other question is, why are people not using enterprise open source for a particular application? And, uh, and here again, here are some pretty familiar uh, objections. So they are concerned about the level of support that they're going to receive. Um, they are concerned about compatibility. Um, they're concerned about the security of the, uh, the actual security of the software that they're using. Um, they're also concerned about the talent and skills required to actually operate that software. Um, this is a very respectable set of concerns. And I am very, I'm as the, as the general manager of a Linux business, I am very comfortable looking at these concerns and here's why. These are the same concerns that customers would have with any software. These concerns are not specific to open source software. I'm, I'm fairly certain that if we surveyed, if we took the words enterprise open source out of this question and made the question about software in general, I think we would get very similar results. What this tells me is that we have a kind of a level playing field uh, for open source versus, versus proprietary alternatives. Um, software ultimately is just software and people are concerned about whether they have the skills to operate it, whether it's going to be secure, whether it's going to be compatible with the other software that we're using and about the level of support that they receive. Uh, so this, uh, this passes the sniff test, right? This makes sense. So let's get into some, let's ask these surveys, these two surveys, let's ask them some specific questions. Um, about the market. And uh, here's a list of them here. So the, the first question I had uh, was, uh, as people move into the cloud, um, it's a, a very fast growing platform for running Linux workloads. Um, does the operating system matter uh, or, uh, or, or, or is it, are the operating systems now interchangeable because now we're buying infrastructure on a meter basis and things like this. So let's learn a little bit more about that. Connected to that question is, is Linux now a commodity? Um, have we have we gone from uh, Gunnar installing Linux on his laptop in his dorm room in college uh, to now Linux is just all of the Linuxes are basically the same and and they're all interchangeable. Have have we gotten there yet? Um, the third question I have is, is: Are we worried about the security of open source? Are we still worried about the security of open source? Um, Obviously, there, there, there have always been concerns about security, software security in general, and then there have been concerns about open source specifically. But is there something about open source, are there characteristics of open source that make people more worried about security or not? Let's, we can learn a little bit more about that. Um, fourth is uh, one of the big uh, one of the big innovations of the last several years is this push towards edge. You've probably heard several hardware and software vendors already talk about how their, their edge strategy and how enterprises are moving to the edge. And this is due to a, a, a large number of, of inter, intersecting market trends and technology trends and things like this. Um, but so how is the, if edge is kind of this emerging market, um, 
look that people are very interested in. What is the role that, that Linux plays in, in, in that market? Um, and then finally, uh, this is a topic that uh, comes up often for me is, uh, do, is there a Linux skills gap? How concerned are people about uh, being able to get the talent that they need in order to operate the Linux uh, that their workloads require? Um, all right, so let's go into each of these questions in turn. We'll start with, uh, does the operating system matter in the cloud? Um, First, uh, here's a very interesting result from our Linux market study is that 75% uh, of the respondents to this survey told us that more than half of their company's Linux workloads uh, are going to be running in the public cloud in the next three years. Uh, okay, that sounds like a lot, uh, and it probably is a lot. Um, and if you, uh, if you take the three-year limit off it and you just say, like, in the future, do you expect it? 96% of them expect that more than half of the workloads are moving to the cloud. Uh, and, okay, so it sounds like, yes, <laughs> it, uh, the public cloud is extremely important and we have to, as a, as a market, as a, as, a, uh, as a community, we have to figure out how to take these on-premise Linux workloads and make sure that they operate uh, correctly in, the, uh, in this public cloud environment. It seems like everybody uh, is doing that now. All right, so with that in mind, uh, what are the primary, uh, what are the primary components that people are thinking about when they're when they're taking a workload and putting it into the public cloud? Well, the number one concern that they have is the Linux operating system itself. Uh, this makes sense uh, because the operating system is the thing on which all of these workloads are going to run. So it stands to reason that uh, that the uh, that you're going to be, pay, be paying a lot of attention to to which Linux operating system that you're running. And then connected to that are things like application servers, Linux management software, developer tools, automations. Uh, what's interesting about this list for me is that several of these items, Linux management software, automation frameworks, and even developer tools, CI CD workflows, these, all of these tools are also deeply rooted in your operating system choice. Um, that is, when you make a choice about an operating system, you are kind of de facto deciding what management software you have available to you, what developer tools you have available to you, what automation frameworks you have available to you. So really, when you're choosing a Linux, you're not just choosing the product itself, you're also choosing an ecosystem of kind of partner workloads uh, that are going to come along with that with that operating system. All right. So there's the question of, of Windows. Uh, so what is the role of Windows? That is, Windows has a massive install base. It is a growing, uh, it, it, is a, uh, it is a business that uh, it's still a going concern. So what's the, what's the Windows versus Linux story? Well, uh, it turns out that um, Linux deployments in the public cloud are outpacing Windows deployments. Um, and so this, again, is an indication that, uh, yeah, people do care about the operating system. Uh, Windows has a large incumbency in the on-premise uh, data centers. And uh, you might expect that uh, when people move to the cloud, that they would naturally be taking those Windows workloads and moving them into the public cloud as well. And some of them are, but the vast majority of folks are uh, using the public cloud uh, as an opportunity to migrate workloads off of Windows and onto, uh, and onto Linux. Um, which is an old time Linux guy is, is frankly very gratifying for me. So, all right. Uh, okay, so this leads to the question. We've been talking kind of generically about Linux here, but uh, are all Linuxes the same, right? Um, uh, one would think that after 20 or 30 years of, of a Linux market that uh, eventually the market would consolidate onto a, uh, a small number of, uh, a small number of participants. Uh, this is in fact not the case. Um, there were dozens and dozens of Linux distributions 30 years ago, and today there are dozens and dozens of Linux distributions. Um, so the question is, well, is Linux a commodity? Are all these distributions fundamentally the same? Um, so one way of answering this question is uh, taking a look at this Linux market study that we did, and we asked them, what were the critical uh, what were the critical differentiators for driving a preference for a particular Linux? In other words, like what are the things that you are going to be looking at in order to decide on one Linux over another? Um, and it's the things that you would expect. It's things like security and reliability and the ability to maintain it, scalability, and so on and so on and so on. I noticed that all seven of these top seven attributes considered critical, uh, these are characteristics that are not ascribed to uh, Linux generically. They are ascribed to uh, Lin a Linux provided by a specific vendor or project. In other words, Linux itself is pretty secure, um, but in order to be extremely secure, uh, you actually need someone whose job it is to make sure that it is extremely secure. Likewise, with the reliability, the project, the open source project are relatively reliable, but in order to ensure their reliability over time, uh, you actually need somebody whose job that is, is to go make sure that it's reliable. 
and you can run down this list. Um, none of these things come naturally, and they all require uh, they all require it to be somebody's job to make sure that they are true and continue to be true. Uh, and so this tells me that Linux is in fact not a uh, commoditized market because um, these dozens of Linux alternatives um, that, I, that I mentioned earlier, each of them are competing with each other and differentiating with each other on the basis of one of these attributes. All right. So we mentioned security earlier. Uh, here's a question is, how do I manage security in open source? Well, 89% of IT leaders uh, think that open source software is as secure, as secure or more secure than proprietary software. Another mind blowing reversal from where we were 25 or 30 years ago when open source was just assumed to not be secure uh, because anybody could take a look at the code and all of your bugs would be out there for everybody to look at. Um, this is a complete reversal. Uh, from from where we were several years ago. Uh, and as somebody who has been in the Linux business for probably my entire career, um, I, I find this result very gratifying. It is now a level playing field. Um, people acknowledge that software is uh, complicated, software is difficult, and software uh, security is always a concern for software, whether that software is open source or proprietary. So this is interesting. This 75%, uh, I mentioned this number earlier, 75% of customers believe that, uh, that open source is not only secure, but an essential component of their overall security strategy. Uh, I think this is I think this is interesting mostly because we did not ask about any particular open source tool. We didn't say um, open source event handling. Uh, we didn't say open source operating systems. It was generically enterprise open source. Is that an important part of your security strategy? Yes. Um, going back to the list of critical attributes for Linux selection, uh, security was uh, was one of those top concerns. And so again, this tells me that. Um, that people are not only relying on open source uh, for their security strategy, but they, they are interested in making sure that they have a vendor who can ensure the ongoing security of their solutions. All right, so here's, a, to get more specific, uh, okay, so you prefer open source and you believe that open source is an essential part of the strategy. Why is it that open source is so relevant to your security strategy? Um, one is, uh, one if I were to summarize these results, um, one of these is about the kinds of tools that are available in open source. And so uh, making sure that the team can use well-tested code for their in-house applications, um, security patches are well-documented to be scanned for. Um, the, uh, the, so part of this is about the open source tools that are available that make it easier for a solution to be secure. The other one is about um, the actual, the nature of open source itself and some of the advantages there. Um, a lot of you have heard the phrase, uh, many eyes make all bugs shallow. Um, and certainly 44% uh, of the respondents believe that yes, indeed, many eyes make all bugs uh, shallow. So it's not just about the kinds of tools that open source produces, but it is the way in which open source is built um, also seems to have some influence on how secure people feel uh, open source is. All right. So at the edge, uh, so again, I mentioned earlier that uh, Edge is extremely popular um, in part because of the way that the hardware market is evolving, in part because of the way that systems management uh, idioms are, are evolving, in part because of the way that um, AIML functions, it becomes it becomes better to kind of push workloads out to the edge so that you can uh, take better advantage of, of those kinds of approaches. And so what choices are being made there? Well, 80% of uh, IT leadership, according to our enterprise open source survey, expect to increase their use of open source, enterprise open source software uh, in uh, emerging technologies. Uh, if you go back to what I said earlier, where many of the kind of fundamental innovations that we've made in the market over the last 20 or 25, 30 years um, have been, have come from Linux and are based on Linux technologies and kind of the adjacent ecosystem. If that is where the innovation is coming from, it makes sense that IT leaders would rely on open source software uh, in order to take advantage of these emerging technologies. Makes sense. So which emerging technologies are we talking about? Well, we're talking about AIML. Uh, and the vast majority of AIML work today is being done on Linux platforms. Um, likewise, edge computing and Internet of Things. Um, if you've got a, uh, if you've got a tiny, tiny computer sitting in a, 
a telephone pole or a tiny computer sitting in a sprinkler head somewhere, uh, chances are extremely good that it is running some flavor of Linux um, as opposed to Windows or, or some alternative. So this makes sense to me. Containers. Uh, container technology, extremely interesting, extremely popular, and rooted in the enabling technologies of Linux. So containers at Red Hat, we're fond of saying containers are Linux, and that is quite literally true because the container technology relies on uh, Linux subsystems in order to make the kind of container plumbing work. Things like uh, C groups for managing resource controls, uh, things like the, even basic things like the process tables, um, technologies like SE Linux. These are all of the uh, these are all, again, the basic enabling te technologies for containers. Um, and then with uh, serverless computing, serverless, the economics of serverless computing, uh, where you have if, uh, very short-lived ephemeral workloads to perform uh, kind of atomic functions um, on behalf of uh, some remote computer, um, the economics of that only work uh, if you have available something like Linux. Um, so uh, for each of these emerging technologies relevant to the to edge, um, Linux uh, is uh, an essential building block. Okay, so Linux is great and Linux is extremely popular. And there's, uh, as my friend Ashish said, there's millions and millions of Linux out there. There are uh, 1.9 million people who kind of like directly, it sounds like make their living directly from uh, Linux, which I find very gratifying. Um, so uh, there is this lingering question that I mentioned earlier about uh, the skills gap and, and how to address it. Um, so if we look at how uh, how important or how uh, how urgent this vendor this uh, skills gap is, um, if we look at the top factors for selecting a Linux distribution, it's you know reliability, security, uh, manage and maintenance. Uh, like we said before, the other one is is vendor skills available in the company. Um, in other words, uh, making sure that folks understand why, uh, making sure that folks understand not just Linux generically, but also the specific Linux that you're deploying in your company. You, have, you need people who have skills and understand uh, kind of the idiosyncrasies and the and the uh, and special tools that are available. Um, having vendor specific skills uh, in the company is a uh, is obviously uh, is obviously important. Um, Often when people ask me what they can do about the, uh, about the, they call it the Linux skills gap. I'm not necessarily persuaded that there aren't enough Linux people with Linux skills out in the world. I think uh, it may be more difficult to acquire people with Linux skills uh, because of the way that the economy is today. Um, in any case, the answer to the Linux skills gap is to standardize the Linux distribution that you're using um, both on premise and up in the cloud and for your edge deployments. Uh, and the reason for this is, is relatively simple. If you are choosing one version of Linux uh, for your on premise deployment and a different one for one cloud provider and a different and a third for another cloud provider and a fourth for your edge deployment, uh, now you don't have one Linux skills problem, you have four Linux skills problems. Um, and it becomes uh, more difficult for a single Linux skilled person uh, to be managing your entire estate. Now, but to the extent that you can, uh, as my friend Ashish said, uh, if you can create a level of standardization or consistency uh, in your Linux distributions and have be able to reuse the same set of skills, whether you're on premise or in a cloud or in the edge, uh, you can actually make your uh, you can actually make your internal operations uh, much more efficient and take advantage of the most precious resource you have, which is the time and attention of your operation staff. Um, and so it stands to reason this makes sense now that forty percent of organizations believe that. Um, uh, forty percent of people believe that the most important thing they can do in order to make moving workloads uh, from the data center to the cloud easier is to standardize uh, the Linux distribution. All right, and then just to put a final grace note on these results, um, thanks for thanks for spending the time with me. I was talking earlier about the consistency um, and. Uh, and the fact that Linux is kind of at the root of all of this innovation. Um, and this is in fact what we do at Red Hat. Red Hat Enterprise Linux, as you can see in this kind of architecture diagram, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is not only uh, the, the basis for the technology stack, it is also the basis for all of the innovation available on top. Um, so if I look at uh, each of the uh, items in the Red Hat portfolio, uh, things like OpenShift Data Foundations, OpenShift itself, um, uh, all of the Red Hat Insights, Satellite, Advanced Cluster Security, all of these tools are intimately connected with Linux itself and in fact would not be possible uh, without, the, without the presence of, of Linux. Um, and so uh, 
uh, inside Red Hat, we often say that Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the is the foundation of the portfolio, and that is and that is very literally true. The portfolio would not be possible without Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, from a customer's point of view, if you are selecting an operating system, I mentioned earlier, when you're selecting an operating system, you're also selecting which ecosystem you want access to, uh, and uh, and so. Again, when you're making your eco, when you're making your selection uh, about Linux, it's very important to consider what options that makes available to you later. Um, and it might be access to the rest of the Red Hat portfolio it might be interesting for you. It might be access to a portfolio of hardware vendors, a portfolio of software vendors. Um, your choice about Linux is really a, a choice about a lifestyle uh, as opposed to any as opposed to making kind of a point uh, technology decision. All right, well, with that, I wanna thank my colleague uh, Ashish. I'm hopefully you've enjoyed this tour of uh, the last uh, 20 or 30 years of, uh, of the Linux market. Um, and now I'd like to hand it over to uh, my friend, Susan Roper, uh, who's gonna help us uh, take some of your questions. Really good content. Um, we're now gonna open things up for live Q and A. So I'm gonna start with a couple for Ashish. Um, so Ashish, in your key findings, you mentioned RHEL ecosystem. How would you define that for our audience? Yeah, that's a good question. So for us, um, uh, the the word ecosystem means uh, a set of vendors, product and services vendors that um, deliver, um, you know, um, something in association with um, the, the vendor whose ecosystem we're talking about. So in this case, the Red Hat enterprise Linux ecosystem would mean any vendor whose products and services directly or indirectly uh, touch or are touched by uh, Red Hat Linux. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I'm going to stick with you, Ashish, for just a minute. We got another question, um, similar, mm -hmm. I think, similar part of your presentation. You really talked about the impact of the pandemic on RHEL projects. Mm -hmm. But as we're kind of seeing things unfold, either economically and both globally today, the questions around what do, what do we think the current impact is going to be um, from our current circumstances on you know projects, world projects, Linux projects, etc. What are you hearing yeah, from your a, customer or your customers? Yeah, it's, uh, I wish I I wish I had a crystal ball, uh, but as it uh, you know, it's a, I would say it's a little too early to tell. Now you know we've been through other types of uh, inflations and. Um, depression uh, cycles, if you will. So people of companies adjust accordingly. The pandemic was kind of a, an odd situation because everything kind of shut down without any, um, you know, end in sight. Whereas some of these, you know, um, cycles, if you will, come and go. And so a lot of times companies are generally prepared to weather it out. Um, but having said that, I think there's always this uh, situation where certain companies might postpone some of their projects because of what's coming down. Um, they might, you know, see some of the, the um, pressures on their business as a, as a reason to, um, you know, slow down or, or put, put a pause on um, their IT spend. Uh, however, I think on the flip side, what we are also seeing is a lot of companies are aggressively uh, transforming themselves digitally. Uh, they want to build in business resiliency into their operating model. And so projects in which that digital transformation is considered to be the foundation, um, new revenue streams that would allow the company to be uh, differentiated. Those kinds of projects, I believe, will continue um, to, to be funded and will continue moving forward. Um, some projects where that is not the case might, in fact, see some uh, pressure. Thank you. That, that makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, no crystal ball. If we did, right, we wouldn't be doing this job. We'd be on somewhere <laughs> on an island with a drink with an umbrella in it or something. I don't know. Yeah. Think about your fantasy jobs, right? Okay. Um, you know, uh, audience, please keep those questions coming. Um, I've gathered a couple for Gunner. So Gunner, um, this one's asking about, so you presented a lot of data and in that data, uh, based on RHEL, did you change anything in the way, did it, how did it influence our roadmap, I guess is, is the best way to phrase that question. Yeah. What did we change yeah, in the a, Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so this and lots of other data, of course, influence our roadmap. I mean, the first thing this, this tells me is that we're on the right track. Like if I look at the list of things that people cared about when they were, when they were worried about Linux, things like security, reliability, I mean, these are all things that RHEL is actually famous for, right? I'm, and so feeling good about that and want to continue delivering all the security and reliability and stability and things that, that people enjoy. Um, <clears throat> I think 
if I look at Ashish's results, I mean, one of the one of the big things about Rel is the is the richness of our ecosystem, right? And when people are choosing a Linux, they're choosing, like I said, uh, at the end there, the, we're choosing a lifestyle, right? And so continuing to broaden and deepen um, all of our partner relationships is an important part of the future. Um, but I think one of the uh, one of the big challenges that we're looking at going forward with Rel is uh, it's it has gotten more. I, it's gone from being difficult. Linux has been, begun from being difficult to acquire because uh, it was 43 and a half inch floppies that you had to stick into your laptop. It's now complicated for a different reason, which is that you have so many choices of ways of acquiring uh, way of acquiring RHEL or Linux. Um, you've got uh, public cloud marketplaces. You've got your OEM. You know, you can buy it from your hardware vendor. You can buy and all of these routes. Each of them have their advantages. Each of them have their disadvantages. And um, as a Linux vendor, one of the big challenges is making sure that it is as easy to get your your Linux through whatever route a, a person prefers while still getting all the same value and ensuring that consistency that I kept talking about earlier. Um, and so I think as we invest in the future of RHEL, I think you're going to see us make, continuing to make investments in um, making that acquisition experience easier and, and taking friction out of that part of the process so that it's easier for folks to access all the things that they value, like the security and reliability and so on. Yeah, makes complete sense, um, especially as moving to a cloud and app driven world, right? Um, all right, Gunnar, uh, one more for you here um, sure. is, let's see. So you talked a bit about Windows, right? Um, so mm -hmm. the question is asking, what kind of workloads are we seeing our customers move from Windows to Linux? Um, yeah. what, what things are landing there? Uh, or yeah, landing it's, on it's, Linux, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. It's because it's, um, uh, if you look at the list, it tells you more about what kind of things people are have been running on Windows more than it tells you about what kind of workloads are on Linux. Um, and so, uh, it's a lot of things are kind of industry specific applications, um, you know, kind of like domain specific uh, applications. That's probably the biggest one. And then, uh, and then after that is uh, there's like customer relationship management software or content management software. That's a big one. And then of course um, ERP software. So enterprise resource planning. Um, those are kind of the those are kind of the big categories. Some of the traditional Linux workloads. Uh, like databases, right? Like a lot of databases run on Linux today. And uh, and it's funny to see, actually, if you look at the list, databases is actually pretty low. And that's not because people don't enjoy running databases on Linux. It's because all those databases already run on Linux. They're not moving from Windows to Linux. Like they're, they're, they're already there. Um, and so actually the databases uh, are kind of lower on the, uh, lower in the ranking. It's really interesting. That's super interesting. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, that wraps up the questions that we have related to the presentation content. Okay, well, thank you to uh, Ashish and, uh, and, and Gunnar and, and Susan for a great conversation there. Really appreciate that. And uh, finally, it's time for our prize drawing. And the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card today is Connor Stillwagon from Missouri. So congratulations to Connor. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Red Hat and IDC for making this event possible. And thanks, as always, for attending and for your great questions. That concludes today's event. Have a fantastic rest of your day.